Um, my name is uh, Jakub Kubrinski, and uh, I'm going to talk about the um, JPA, uh, Java Persistence API, and um, I'm going to talk about the details, but also about, about some tricky parts, uh, about the uh, consequences of the action um, uh, which uh, we are taking uh, all the time. And uh, it's, uh, th this talk is a uh, JPA training in a nutshell. So I, 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 I run, I do uh, JPA uh, trainings for Bottega company. And I saw that there is a lot of things that I thought they are obvious and they should be obvious for med medium and senior developers. And uh, there were a lot of concern regarding some, some things and I want to cover such tricky parts, such things during this, this talk. So uh, <clears throat> a little bit about me. So I work as a co-founder of DevSkiller. It's a platform that allows uh, uh, online um, programming skills assessment. So we verify if someone is, for, for example, able to work to, to extend the, the existing software using JPA, using Spring, using Maven, using Oracle databases. So the real world uh, uh, programming skills assessment. Uh, as I've already mentioned, I, I work as a trainer for a Bottega company. I am also a program committee member of, of DevOps PL, so of the conference that we are here. And I'm a, a co-author um, generally with Marcin Grzeszczak of the Spring Cloud contract uh, project. Um, you can find my Twitter handle here, so feel free to follow me, He'll feel free to um, um, tweet about uh, questions, about some, some um, information that you would like to, to receive. So the problem is that currently the uh, problem solving algorithm uh, is very simple. It's just, uh, you get some exceptions, so you Google for the error message, you find an answer on the Stack Overflow, probably like five different answers, and you just iterate for, for, for uh, each answer, just copy paste the solution, check if it works, if it works then great break, if it's uh, not working, then continue looking for an answer. The problem is that uh, we don't understand usually the code we are, we are um, pasting. So the problem is that I've pasted something, okay, it solved my problem, but how? How it works under the hood? I have no idea. Maybe I've just exposed some business functionality to all users, to all over the world, and I don't know about that. Okay, so um, now I want to uh, tell about something more than just copy-pasting the answer, so understanding each important part um, of, of the JPA. And <clears throat> Joel Spolsky said many years ago that all non-trivial abstractions to some degree are leaky. What's the problem? Uh, the problem is that we know that JPA is an abstraction for the SQL, okay? And a SQL is an abstraction for the database query language. The problem is that when something is really, mm, when you try to do something really uh, advanced, then you are not allowed to rely on the abstraction because the Hibernate queries, Hibernate model for different databases will look in a different way. When I'm writing SQL, Query, okay, I can write a generic SQL query, but if I'm using Oracle, I want to use some Oracle specific functions. So great that SQL is, is an abstraction, but I need, I need to know how it works under the hood. Okay, as well in Hibernate. I know what the entity um, annotation does, but maybe there are some tiny differences between different JPA implementations, between Hibernate and J J uh, Open JPA. And that's something that we call the, that those, those abstractions are leaking, okay? And now let's cover those, those abstractions. So this is just an example of the very simple entity. What's wrong with this example? Do you see anything wrong here? I have some uh, stickers uh, of DevSkiller so I can give it as a, uh, awards for good answer. Any idea? Uh, it's generated value, so it's by default. Okay, the problem is that the column annotation here does exactly nothing, okay? What we use column annotation for is to define some additional column information, like change the name, 
tell the JPA provider if, the, um, uh, if this column is nullable or not, if I can update it or not, etc. But all fields that are in the entity are persist by default, okay? So you don't need to add anything to mark, okay, so this um, uh, field, the name is a column. It should be treated as a database column. It will be treated uh, even with this without this annotation. So this annotation here does exactly nothing, okay? Another example, what's wrong with this code? Save. save. What's wrong with save? Exactly, so I'm telling here explicitly that I want to save this entity, but it's not needed because it's transactional method. When a method is transactional, then JP provider cares about all changes made to the managed entities. So the JP provider is uh, using something that is called a dirty, uh, uh, dirty tracking. So it checks if the entity state has changed, and if the entity state has changed, then it saves and flashes all the changes into databases without explicitly saving the product. Why it's important? It's Really huge problem uh, that I use the product repository that save here. Maybe not now, but imagine that someone has added some validation and he adds uh, uh, additional logic. If product is valid, then save. Okay, great. But else it will also be safe. And I saw a lot of code made in this world. I'm not saving this entity, everything is okay. No, you are saving this entity and it's not okay. Okay. Another um, uh, important information uh, about the fields and getters. So we know that we can put annotations on a getters or on a fields. So who thinks that annotations on a getters are a good idea? Just raise your hands. Okay, no one. Annotations on fields. Okay. So, like 90% have no idea which one is better. So, <clears throat> to be honest, there is no big difference between using annotations on fields and on getters. It's more about the religion than about the technology. Of course, when you use the annotation, when you, when you place the annotation on a, on a field, then Hibernate is using reflection. It's using the access to the field to, uh, to, to, to manage the state. So, we don't need to have getters and setters. And I see a lot of entities with annotations placed on fields with getters and setters. Why do you need getters and setters? I don't know, maybe Hibernate is using that. Okay, so I have no idea if those, uh, if those setters and getters are used or not. I'm just adding them by default, okay? And the real problem is that when you decide, for example, that, okay, so let's go with annotations on fields. And new person joins your project. And he's from the other religion that places all annotations on getters. The problem is that single annotation on getter is enough to change the access rules for the whole class. So I have 10 annotations on fields. I've added another annotation on getter. All annotations of on fields are ignored right now. So if there is no getter and setter for some field, it won't be persisted because I've changed the access to the class, the type of the access. So if you want to use fields as well as the getters, you must tell explicitly that access on this class is an access by field, but for this property, I'm using the property access. Without this property access, the whole uh, uh, access type on the class will be, will be changed and that can make serious, serial, um, uh, serious uh, problems. Okay, another thing. So what's wrong with this code? Uh, there is ID somewhere here, hidden. What's wrong with the code we see here? Error. 
What's wrong with the name of the class? Yes, exactly. It's a keyword. So I cannot use this class because I will get an exception that it's incorrect grammar. Okay? I've expected the identifier, but order is found. So what can I change? The first answer on Stack Overflow is just change the name of your entity. So I'm changing it to orders. And let's see. Yay, works. Insert into orders. Great. Do you know what's wrong with this problem? It's solved or not. Let's try to write a query. Create query, select all from order OO. What happens? No such entity. OK? This is a J uh, JPQL. It's Java Persistence Query Language. But I used to name the entities and name uh, objects here from the name of the class. But I've changed the name of the entity. So there is no entity called order. There is entity called orders. OK? So I've changed the name uh, of the entity, which results in changing the name of the table, but it does, did more than I expected. So to m fix this, to solve this problem in a good way, we just leave the entity as it is, and we change the name of the table. Table is a similar annotation as column. Okay? We use it when we want to change the database representation no, the, uh, not not the uh, ORM, ORM model, OK? But that's very simple stuff. Let's move to something more interesting. Let's move to the mappings, OK? What's wrong with this code here? Any ideas? Stickers with all that kills poor programmers with sword are waiting. What's wrong here? Yes, but what's wrong with bidirectional mapping? Do we need? Yeah, we don't know where, who is the owner of this relationship. So what does it mean that, uh, let's say that address is the owner of the customer? It tells us where should we place the foreign key, OK? So where should I place the foreign key here? I don't know. So let's use two foreign keys, OK? And, it's just, and, and, and that's the default um, uh, behavior of the hibernate. So it will, hibernate will create two um, uh, foreign keys, OK? So now the question, how can I delete this object or this relation? I cannot, OK? And the cool thing is that when you execute entity manager delete and you pass this customer, Entity manager will say, yeah, deleted. But it's still in the database. No exception, no any information, just nothing. It just won't be uh, deleted. So if you want to use the bidirectional mapping, you must tell explicitly, hey, it's mapped by the address. OK? So that's the owning side of my relationship. OK? So the customer is owner of the address. OK, now that was a simple example. What's wrong here with this code? Simple, one to many entity. Customer has a set of addresses. What's the problem? So I've, I will ask you one more thing. Do we need a linking table here? Exactly. No, we don't, but Hibernate is not aware of this cool feature that we can store one to many relationships in a database without using join column. So for this mapping, Hibernate will create a join table. So there will be uh, three tables, customer address and a customer address. Why? Just because. Okay? So if you want to use the one to many as it should be uh, stored, then you must tell explicitly, hey, Use the join column, please. Okay? Don't create linking table for one too many relationships. Okay? That's wrong. So the question is, what's wrong 
with this relation. Do we need a joint table here? Yes, we need. So what can go wrong? Yes, Hibernate will create two linking tables. OK, just to be sure that it's linked in, in, in the best, best possible way. OK, so there will be four tables, customer, address, customer address, and address customer. OK, two linking table. Why? Just because. OK, as you probably can imagine, it's not the most effective way of mapping and it is in Hibernate. But often we are not uh, aware of this stuff, especially when we are creating some model from, from, uh, um, uh, from the beginning. Because when you join a project and this project contains a lot of tables, then you just simply add additional stuff. But when you design the database model from scratch, then it can create serious, ser serious problems with performance, for example. OK? So let's move to the next topic, which is lazy loading. We know that lazy loading uh, is, it means that we are loading the element from the database only when the element is needed, not ahead of time, but just in time that they access some, some element. And hi, we, we have two proxying mechanisms in Java. One is proxying by, by subclassing, so it's the way that Hibernate does it. Uh, using, for example, CGLib or JavaSyst. And the second one is dynamic uh, proxies. So we are using interfaces, OK? It probably um, um, will be a stupid idea to create interfaces to entities containing getters and setters. So Hibernate is just extending the, the entity, OK? And is there anything special that we must remember about when writing the entity so this entity could be lazy loaded. It cannot be final. It cannot contain final methods. And one more time. Yes, default constructor, not private default constructor. OK? And these are requirements that we must met to be able to use lazy loading, right? No. Why? Because what are the 90% of the use cases when we use la lazy loading? Or for, for which data, for which type of data? For strings, for doubles, for collections. Exactly. And the good thing about the collections is that set list, these are interfaces. When I use the collection, when I use set, when I use list, it's a collection, it's an interface. And can I use my own implementation of this interface? Of course I can, and that's what Hibernate does. Okay, so Hibernate, when you put the set in your list, it's not using the hash set, even if you, you know, assign it manually, it will use the persistent set. And what's the difference between persistent set and set? The difference is that this set is persistent, OK? So for example, this set knows if it's initialized or not, OK? And if you are trying to access any element of this set, then Hibernate checks, OK? So is this set initialized already? No, it's not. So please initialize this set and then return the element. So I don't need any proxying of the entity itself. Because proxying the field is enough, OK? So for 99% of the use cases of lazy loading in Hibernate, we can use final classes, uh, we can use um, uh, final methods, and we can use um, uh, private constructors, and that's OK. That's something that Hibernate is, is able to deal with this. But as you can see, there are three implementation, persistent set, persistent back, and persistent list. So the question is, what's the, uh, what's the, the, the kind of implementation used here? Set, back, or list? It's a set. What does it mean, it's a set? It means that there are no duplications, OK? Yeah? Set doesn't allow us to, to keep uh, 
um, and duplications, there is no order. And what's important here, if I add an element to the list, to the set, I only need to use uh, let's say two queries. First, to check if this element is really unique. So I need to load this element. And second query, insert statement to insert the element. When I'm removing something from the set, I'm invoking the one delete statement. And when you need to update something, then you invoke one update statement, OK? So two statements for insert, one for update, and one for delete. OK, very effective, uh, very effective uh, way of uh, mapping the collection. So what's this one? Per set bag of list. It's a list. It's Java list. So what's the problem? The problem is that it's not a list. It's a bag. What's the difference between bag and list? Any ideas? Ordering, yes, exactly. We are we used to use, for example, like products dot get zero, get one, get two, etc. Okay. The problem is that it's a bag, not a list, and a bag doesn't guarantee any order, so there is no ordering here. Yes, we are allowed to use duplicates, and no, there is no order. So, what's the problem here? Is it a big deal that there is no order and there are duplicates or not? It's a huge problem because imagine that I want to add something to my list, OK? Am I able to invoke just one insert statement? No, because after adding this in insert statement, is it a correct state of this collection, or, or I've just accidentally added duplication? No idea. So I need to recreate this list. So I need to remove all entities from the database and insert them one more time. Another problem. When I'm removing something from this list, let's say that I have three products. Uh, uh, maybe differently. I have a product that is added to this list three times. How can I remove just one instance of this product? No way to do that. So I need to remove all products and insert those which are still valid one more time to the database. OK, so I'm recreating the whole bag in the database. And when I update, it's OK, because update is still just one Query. Okay, so if you have 100 elements in your bag and you remove one thing, then you are executing 100 uh, SQL statements for the database, which makes no sense. And uh, why should I use list? Why should I use bag? Only when I intentionally want to use duplicates. When you take a look at your um, uh, mappings, then I'm pretty sure that you are using list or collection because it's the same in many entities and only in one or two of them you in fact need duplicates. So if you want your uh, entities and your collections performed well, please always use set if it's possible. So how can we use list? I want to have an order. Yeah, list. One to many, and also order column annotation, which adds another column to my database, which just stores the order. The problem is that when, uh, if you are coding in basic, then you know that we are ordering the lines like uh, the first line, tenth line, twenty, thirty, forty, that we are able to insert something in the middle, and it was fifteen. Okay, line fifteen. So it's not something that JPA is aware of. So it keeps the ordering continuous. So one, two, three, four, five. If you want to remove something from the middle, then it's one delete statement to remove the product with order number five. And then all next products must be updated to reduce the ordering. 
Okay, so if you have 1,000 products and you're removing the first, then 999 uh, statements will be executed to change order two to one, three to two, four to three, etc., etc. 999 to 998. So remember, uh, remember uh, about that. Okay. So moving next, staying with collections. The most serious performance issue in the JPA is the n plus one select problem. What's the n plus one select problem? So imagine that we have user entity with list of addresses which is lazy loaded, okay? I'm loading the list of users and then I'm iterating over the users list and for each user I'm iterating over the addresses list, okay? So if I have 10 users, then how many times would I load the addresses table? 10 times for each user when using the first address, okay? I will make here get of zero and Hibernate will execute the statement to lazy load this element. So 10 users mean 10 queries for loading the address, addresses list, and 11th for loading the user. Okay, that's the serious problem uh, because imagine that you have thousands of users and you're lazy loading um, uh, some, some information here. It means thousands of queries, which in fact sucks, especially when I will be loading, for example, get adre address get streets. Okay, then it will be just an abnormal uh, amount of queries. So how can I solve it? So there is a simple workaround uh, that's a Hibernate specific blind feature when you can say that, hey, batch size for this list is 10. What does it mean? When Hibernate loads the addresses list for the first user and it knows that the user is loaded in a list, then it will load nine more addresses. So there is no more n plus one, but it's n divided by 10 plus one problem, okay? And is there any way to solve this problem? Of course there is, we can use join fetch. So select u from user u, join fetch u dot addresses. I can also use join fetch all properties, okay? So please load this u and load everything that is uh, important here because I want to use all the stuff that is uh, available in this uh, place. Okay, next thing. Uh, how can we save something to the database? There are two methods on the Entity Manager. One is called the persist, and the second method is called the merge. And what's the problem? The problem is that persist works only for the new entities, and the merge works for new entities and for detached entities as well. So the good idea is to use merge all the time, right? No, why? Because how merge is able to, uh, uh, let's say, get the information if this entity is new or is detached. I need to execute the select statement, say, hey, Database, dear database, do you have an entity with such ID? No, okay, so I need to insert it. Do you have an entity with such ID? Yes, okay, so I need to merge it. I need to update this entity. Another cool problem is that I've so many times when someone replaced the persist with merge and was happy. Any ideas what's wrong with just replacing the name persist to name merge? Different signatures of the methods. Persist is a void method. When you pass the entity to the persist method, this passed entity becomes managed entity after returning from the function. And it doesn't work for merge because merge is not void method, it returns T, okay? So when you pass the user to the merge method, merge method copies the user state into new entity, saves this new copy, and returns this copy. 
So the entity that were passed to the merge method is not longer used by Hibernate. Okay? So that's the problem. You must use the entity that is returned by the merge method, not the one that you passed. So it's the totally different idea than for the persist method, which can bring us to serial serious problems. But let's move on to the next issues. Optimistic locking. Do we know how optimistic locking works? It's a simple idea. So I have additional field. This field can be an uh, integer, but it also can be a timestamp. Any ideas? Why could I use the uh, timestamp as a version? Is there something that I, I, I gain for free by using the timestamp as a version? Exactly. Last update date for free. Okay? If you want to, for example, pull all changes from the database that were made in the last five minutes, voila. Get or give me all fields with the version higher than something. Okay, it's there are all, these are all entities that were changed in the last last five minutes. So how it works? It works in this way that um, a hibernate adds this version uh, into the where statement. So uh, update user set name equal to something, where ID equal to five, and version equal to three. When there is no, uh, uh, if the entity with version three is no longer available in the database, it will be just ignored. Hibernate will realize that zero um, records rows were updated, so it will throw the optimistic log exception. Really simple uh, idea. But what's happening in REST? Is there optimistic locking in REST? We've moved, we, we moved from JPA, uh, from, from JSP or from uh, GWT applications into Angular, but the processing model is still the same. What's the difference? The difference is that in JSP, we're operating usually on the entity. And the entity was the thing that were updated in the model. So when I was just, of course, the entity was deserialized and detached, but then it was merged and all, um, as well as the version of the entity that I was updating in the UI. But in Angular, I'm serializing the entity, not as a Java object, but as a JSON or XML or something else. And I send this DDO to the browser, user edits it, and sends it back to the server without the version. So what I'm doing, I'm loading this entity from the database, I'm updating the properties, and I'm saving. The problem is that verse, lo optimistic locking, the versioning of this entity, works only in the backend. Okay? So entity can live for 10 weeks in UI in my browser, and I will be able to save it. So if you want to use optimistic locking when you are deserializing the entity into DTOs, you must do it manually. There is no way for Hibernate to take care about that. So how we do that? We add the version field into the DTO, and when you receive the DTO from the browser, you load the entity, you manually check if DTO get version equals entity get version, and if it's not equal, you manually throw new optimistic lock exception, and if not, then you continue processing. Huge problem in REST applications using uh, the optimistic locking. Let's move on. Identity. The most basic methods in object, in Java object equals and hash code. OK? How can I implement equals and hash code in the entities? Any ideas? I could use the ID, right? ID looks like a great idea because it's unique. It's fixed. It's not changing. Is it changing or not? Yeah, it, there, there is big, bigger problem. Imagine that 
I'm creating a user, okay? And a user will contain three addresses. So the user has a set, okay? And I'm adding new addresses equal new hash set, okay? Then I'm creating new address and user dot add new address. What's the idea of this address? It's not persisted to the database, so there is no ID, okay? So what's the hash code of this method? Let's say zero. So it, all three addresses are placed in a bucket for the hash code zero. Then I persist it to the database, and I want to check if this address is contained in this, um, uh, in this set. So I just invoke the set dot contains, and I pass the address, and set says that there is no address. Why? Because the hash code has changed. Okay? After persisting, the hash code is no longer zero. It's one or two or three or ten. And the hash structures like hash set or hash map are looking into incorrect buckets. So yes, this set is, this address is inside a set, but in the wrong bucket, and, and I'm not able to retrieve it anymore. So that's the serious problem. And there is just one solution for that, and it's a very strange solution, because we need to add, uh, we need to add the UUID, okay? So the long UUID to our, all our entities just to be able to use hash code and equals on detached, uh, on detached entities, okay? And that's uh, uh, 32 or 36 additional chars for every single entity just to be able to implement the hash code and equals properly to work with detached and unpersisted objects, okay? So we must remember about that, but in fact, as it's the only uh, reasonable solution, we add it as a base entity. It's the public abstract class mapped as a mapped superclass, so it's not the hibernate inheritance. It's just a Java inheritance. And here we use the UUID that we use for creating the hash code and for equals. And this one is really immutable, okay? It's assigned during the Java object creation and it lives forever with this object because it's persisted in the database. And yes, we need to persist it in the database because we've, if we won't persist it into the database, okay, then after retrieving the, uh, the, the entity, it will be different. So please remember about that because equals and hash code for entities is extremely hard topic. Next hard topic, it's the caching, okay? What's the problem with cache? We have three levels of caching in Hibernate. Level one cache, so it's the entity manager cache. Second level cache, which works on a whole application, and uh, query cache. And now we must also um, uh, uh, learn a little bit more about flash mode. So there are four flash modes in Hibernate. Manual, commit, auto, and always, okay? Do you know which one is the default? It's the auto. So the question is, what's the difference between auto and commit? Yeah, the problem is that commit works only when you commit the transaction. Then we are flashing the data uh, changes to the database because all operations that you uh, execute on entity manager. So if you use entity manager dot persist, it doesn't save your entity to the database. It's saved only to the first level cache, okay? And only during the flash, the changes from the first level cache are transferred to the database. The problem is that imagine the situation that I'm adding a user and I'm using the flash mode commit. I've added the user using the entity manager dot persist new user and I want to run some query. I'm running the query not on the entity manager but on the database. But the user is not yet in the database. Okay? So that's the difference because auto 
when it realizes that you are invoking a select for the entity that has been changed in the transaction, will flush all the changes, then execute the query. Okay, so that's the big difference between commit and auto. Auto is an intelligent version of commit. So what are the pitfalls of the first level cache as it's so simple? The problem is that when you invoke the persist or when you update the entity, it's only changed in the first level cache. So let's imagine the situation that we are using the batch processing, okay? I'm sending to the database 10,000 entities. And okay, so I'm adding these entities and at the end of the transaction, I'm, I want to flush them all to the database. So now Hibernate tries to flush 10,000 entities to the database at once, which is not a good idea, as you probably can imagine. So what can I do? I can flush the entities between, uh, for every 100 entities. So I've added 100 entities and I'm flushing them to the database. But the problem is that when you flush the database changes, those entities are still present in the entity manager. Okay? So if I'm just flushing the changes, it means that entity manager needs to check more and more entities to know if there should be flush or not. Because I've added one entity and I'm calling flush. Hibernate checks, okay, this entity is new, I need to flush this entity to the database. So it executes the update insert statement, okay? Then I'm adding the second entity and I'm evoking the flush. So Hibernate, see, okay, I have two entities in my level one cache, first level cache. Is the first entity flushed? Yes, it's flushed. Okay, and the second one? No, second one not. Okay, so I'm flushing the second entity. I'm adding another entity, invoking flush. Hibernate C, three entities in the first level cache. Is first entity flushed? Yes. Second entity? Yes. Third entity? No. Okay? So the time of such operation grows and grows and grows, and, 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 and it go, uh, grows geometrically. Okay? So the thing is that I need to flush the changes to the database, and then clear the first level cache. Or knowing, and remember, uh, I must remember also that this first level cache, it's not the first level cache, in fact. It's the buffer, okay? It's my working buffer. If you invoke the entity manager clear, all entities that you want to persist into the database are gone. I've just removed all the work. So it's working buffer, not first level cache. Please remember about that. So yes, for batch processing, we execute flush and then clear, not in the opposite direction. Clear and flush, okay, it will work extremely fast, but no changes will be stored to the database. Okay, so what's wrong with the second level cache? Distributed environments. Imagine that I have two instances of my application. I'm loading the user with ID 1 on the first instance, and then I'm changing this user on the second instance, okay? And then on the first instance, I'm trying to load this user one more time, and my first instance says, hey, cool, it's in my second level cache, so I'm returning it. It's outdated entity. So if you want to use the second level cache for the clustered applications, you must remember that this cache must be distributed. So any changes made to any cache must propagate in the whole cluster. Usually we are just evicting the entities. So I don't want to use this, this cluster as a distributed store. I can do it, but it, it brings another, another problems like serializing these entities, sending them all over the network. So the easiest thing is just, okay, so if you've changed the user with ID 1 to 3, so please evict this user with ID 1 to 3 from all uh, caches, okay? Next thing, HQL injection, my favorite. We all know that for prepared statement, we must use binded parameters because there could be a SQL injection. But we don't use SQL anymore. We have fancy frameworks like Hibernate. So why for the OWASP top 10, on the first place, there is still SQL injection? 
Okay, because I can write such query and it should be safe because it's not SQL. It's HQL and Hibernate is smart. It will protect me from myself, okay? And will Hibernate execute such query? No, it will be changed to select some aliases from product P0 uh, underscore zero underscore where something etc. Okay, but it won't translate this one. So we still need to use binded parameters for HQL because the SQL injection is as well possible in the HQL. And I've seen a lot of HQL statements built by the string builder instead of binding parameters. So please don't do that because there is still a possibility to use the HQL injection, okay? So that's something that you must, that you must, uh, you must uh, remember. Okay, so if you want to get more information, there are um, a few great uh, materials. First, remember about verifying the Hibernate logs. If you are executing the application locally, please check what logs are provided by the Hibernate. Please verify what is the schema generated by the Hibernate. What tables with which columns are generated, okay? If you are executing some statement, if you are using the uh, operating, um, uh, you are operating the business logic, please verify what statements are sent by the Hibernate to the database. Also, Hibernate is open source, and I recommend sometimes trying to debug. If you see something strange in Hibernate, like this uh, flash that it's you know not not remembering that um, uh, which entities were flashed, we can check it by 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 googling uh, by by debugging Hibernate code. And there is a guy called the Vlad Mihalcea, who is the real expert in the JPA and in Hibernate. It works for the last two years for the Hibernate core team. And uh, he has written a book which is called The High Performance Java Persistence. I recommend this book because it's the best and the only good book about the JPA and the Java Persistence. He's also running a blog with a lot of content for free, and there is also a library called Juke. It's created by the Luca Setter, who is the serial uh, SQL expert, one of the best experts in the world, and it's the different approach to persisting um, uh, uh, from Java, because in Hibernate, we are not controlling the SQL statement, and in Juke, you are writing the SQL statements like insert, update, etc but using the generated type safe and strongly typed code for your application. Okay, so that's all. I don't think we have more time for questions, but I will be here. So if you will have any questions, uh, then you can uh, ask them just after the presentation or tomorrow or on Friday because I'm here until the end of the conference. Remember that you can vote for the talk if you liked it. Remember that you can skip voting if you dislike this presentation. And that's all from myself. Thank you very much. <laughs>